hang out for a while, okay? We're gonna hang out for a while. We're waiting on, on Daemon, it's a little bit early uh, in, in Comrade's timeline, but in the meantime I'm gonna hang out with you all. Uh, just a heads up, we're gonna start, we're gonna start talking about uh, the recent history of Spain, uh, considering, you know, in historical terms, it was like 80 years ago to 40 years ago. We're, we're, we're going to start, you know, as a startup point, we're going to... Whoa, thank you for all the gift subs. Whoa. Thank you, thank you so much, and have a great day, okay? Don't worry about it. I'll upload this to YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube later on, uh, just, you know, catch me up on Twitch if it doesn't, you know, cost you money or, you know, supposed to be like a... A big effort or something. Just, just let me know, okay? <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. So we're we're gonna be talking about a little bit about how you know, being religion a good thing to have personally. You know, some institutions take it a little bit. Uh, yeah, they take it a little bit far further than they should that they ought to, and you know. Well, but, you know, we'll get there when we get there, okay? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, if you're catching this up on YouTube, it doesn't really cost a lot to hang out on Twitch. Check it on my Twitter. And for all of my people uh, here following live on Twitch, I sometimes do YouTube videos that go out on YouTube as well. Got, like, a catalog already going on. That's pretty cool. So doesn't hurt to check them out they're also free to watch that's kind of the whole point otherwise i wouldn't have done it if there was like a paywall or something this this wouldn't be happening okay <laughs> but yeah we're, we'll get there we'll we'll get there i hope everybody's all right considering things and you know i hope you know things will get better soon with uh, everybody's collective work okay putting it together Oh, thank you. Thank you for thinking that my content is is great. I I'm I'm definitely trying, okay? <laughs> definitely trying. I don't know how my level of success is, but you know, if it if it makes some of you all people happy, that's I'm 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 but absolutely happy too. You know what I mean? So let's see, let's see. Okay, we're still, you know. Hey, look, look what the cat dragged in. It's Damon Garcia himself. Welcome, so good to see you. It's been, it's been a while. <laughs> oh, it's so good. How are you doing? I. I hear you. I hear you. Top of the morning to you. I hope you you have a nice breakfast and and that, you know that the rest of the day is splendid. That's 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 my my message to you. So we got oh queer queer potters is in the chat as well. Oh welcome welcome. We we had queer potters the queer queer potters the other day it was a great conversation. Oh, so good. So many good people. Uh so. Okay, wait a sec. That was my bad. Gotcha. Uh -oh. Gotcha, gotcha. So t tell these people, you know, about yourself. Uh, introduce yourself to these wonderful people. You know, Hello. I like putting wonderful people together. So go for yeah. it. Yeah. I um. Hey, what's up? I'm Damon. Uh, who is Damon on Twitch? And you'd find my YouTube, youtube.com slash Damon Garcia. And I like to talk about the way that leftist politic politics end up intersecting with Christianity. And so that means trying to talk about Christianity in a different way and, um, and talking about a more liberationist kind of Christianity inspired by a lot of liberation theology. And that also uh, means 
uh, that we combat some of the narratives of right wing Christianity too. So it's um, I find myself like in a lot of weird, interesting intersections by having these conversations. But um, but I love I love having them, it's especially with people um, who are able to talk about similar stuff from different angles. And I know you do too. Yeah. And so I think uh, I love whenever we can talk. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. So good to have you on. So yeah, be, be, please make sure to follow Damon on on, on both. You, you got a Twitch channel, right? Yeah. Cool. Who's Damon? Who is Damon? Wait, let me host you right now. Right on. Uh, <laughs> And who is Damon? Uh, probably also on Twitter and also yes. on YouTube. Uh, so, you know, all kinds of good stuff waiting for you. Like uh, all, the, all the absolutely pertinent conversations on how, you know, the right wing has tried to capitalize uh, religious feelings to their own evil causes and how that's absolutely wrong. So let's not, let's not do it. <laughs> Yeah, I know you've seen some of the worst of it in Spain. Oh yeah, and and so it's it's funny like in um, in the United States there there are a lot of reasons to dislike Christianity for sure, but in the United States I don't think we've seen like the the worst of it. I mean, presently we're not seeing the worst of it um, historically through like manifest destiny. That's some of the worst of it. But when mm -hmm. people like are able to look around, um, I think there are other countries that are experiencing uh, some Christo fascism a lot worse. And so there are. Uh, and, and so I, I know that some people will say, like in the United States, well, I don't like any of this Christianity stuff because uh, when I was younger, I had to go to church and the youth pastor was really mean. But in Spain, they've seen things way more brutal than that. They've seen Christians act way, yeah. way worse than that. Yeah. And so, so, so I think that's interesting too, where it's like, I think you have way more reasons to dislike Christianity than uh, most Americans do. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, but in a way we have that, that, those many reasons, but at the same time, it's like, we respect, you know, that people want to be Christian and that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's key, you know? You got to understand that, you know, I mean, the way I see it and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's like religion is something that you hold very deep in your in your in your very core of your being. Let's say that I don't want to be like a science centric or, a, you know, put it in, pin it down in whatever section of your brain or whatever. But in yourself, yeah. in your own self, your own perception of self, there's a mysticism there. Right. Um, some kind of. a I don't want to call it magical thinking, but kind of of, of a, a very intuitive perception of the world that you hold very dear and it's unique to you. And for me, it's like when an organized religion is trying to, you know, uh, unify all of those things, you know, into the more or less same standards. It's like they're digging with their fingers in the in these people's, you know, self of self and trying mm -hmm. to manipulate in that very intimate spot and kind of kind of sucky because I, I really love, you know, people having spiritual f feelings and, and I kind of envy it because I'm, I'm at some point I'm a, this, you know, kind of dismal, uh, very nah, dull vision of the world. And I, I really like, you know, that, that kind of joy and good stuff that can bring you, you know, having that mystical way of thinking and uh, feeling actually, you know, but, but, you know, it's really cool when everybody has it, but it's really uncool when everybody, when well, some institutions try to normalize it and impose it on others by force. And that's where really, mm. it's, that's where the, bah, but the, you know, the disconnection happens. I don't know. What? It, yeah. I, I, I think there's a different stages of, um, of development, even within religion, because like you, you mentioned magical thinking there. I, th I think when we think the negative sides of magical thinking, we think people who assign supernatural meaning to everything to the point where it ends up hindering them from seeing reality. And there, there's that in plenty of forms, but yes, definitely in religion. But then there are people who stay religious, but keep on growing and developing and learn 
oh, that's not what my religion is for, for right me on. to just assign meaning to every little thing. And they're able to, to go deeper with it and realize um, that even within like historical uh, religious tradition, there are people who challenge that idea of assigning supernatural meaning to everything. Like within Christianity and Judaism in the book of Job, that whole thing is Job suffering and asking God, why would you do this to me? And his friends surrounding him saying, well, he probably did it because you have sin in your life. Another friend saying, you probably did it because he's testing you. Another friend, you probably did it and you have sin, but you don't know you have sin. And then the end, God is like, where were you all when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he doesn't answer them. He just asks them questions too. It's a whole book of questions. <laughs> and then it just like kind of ends. And he says, now I've seen God. So it's like, I, I feel like that book and other parts of uh, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament is challenging that idea of um, looking for supernatural meaning in everything. And so, so, so there is that struggle even within um, the religious tradition as well. And so I think, um, I want to help people to also like continue to grow and develop and, um, be in, in the world, living out their faith responsibly and healthy instead of, um, just being swayed every which way and not actually thinking about how their faith is affecting the world. Right on. And growth is kind of yeah. something that we never stop doing anyway so you know yeah every, every little bit of help is always welcome very welcome you know <laughs> yeah it's sad to see I, i've seen that too in like entering these uh leftist spaces is that certain people it's like that they they grew up in like a, a conservative church environment and they liked that they were being able to they were being encouraged to grow and they're being encouraged to learn things and to be more like spiritually healthy and learn practices that can help their sanity and then they left and now they're hoping to find other places and they some people never do um and i think that's like very unfortunate that we don't have um uh practices for basic spiritual and mental and emotional health that are more accessible without like certain um supernatural religion attached to it yeah it feels like the right the right they did a good job at, at trying to capitalize all of those spaces and and it's it's very it's very good to 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 take them back you know for for the people for for you know to help mm -hmm. <laughs> to help it's not so difficult sometimes we just want to help it's something i'm saying all the time it's like we're yeah. not here to harm we're here to help <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah I, I i i see why you know you wanted to pick this this topic of conversation of why you know what you know why things are bad in the united states uh things are kind of worse in some parts of latin america right now and uh, mm -hmm. like uh, like the thing with Bolivia and Brazil are egregious in mm -hmm. a way that I, like the the um, what are, what, are they, what are, I keep forgetting the name you know the evangelical uh, mm -hmm. you know people are really into getting into positions of power and big wealth and you know it's kind of like uh, I remember when we talked back in the day well and about the the gospel of of uh, um, what's the name uh, the, the um, Ah, well, the pr prosperity gospel, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember we were talking about how that's an absolute perversion of what, you know, being religious is. And I uh, wanted to pick, uh, like, uh, Spain, the Spanish uh, Catholic Church, their role into the Franco regime, it's, it's yeah. egregious, right? Yeah, I never... Um, yeah, we... we happened to both be on Trekkie's stream recently, and I was just... Yeah. I, I was asking Trekkie first what he knows or what they know about um, Franco fascism, because I never really learned about it. I ne never really see people talk about it, but I feel like it's important from my perspective where I'm um, looking up the ways that like religion and politics have intersected in awful ways and good ways. And, um, and, the, and every now and then I would even in, in studying some Latin American history, uh, find myself coming across references to Sp Spanish-born Franco-fascist priests that came over to Latin America and were trying to institute a similar Catholicism. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so 
and so and so yeah and then on that stream i was i asked you a bit like about it and so and then i said that i would i would be down to talk more about it and um but i think it's it's interesting also because there are people online who uh like there's there's all kinds of weird different types of fascists online who are just nerdy about fascism and so there's also catholic fascists and clerical fascists online who are grew up in the united states and i don't think they like fully realize well i i guess for them franco uh spain was just like kind of a fantasy for them and they think well, it was probably great because they're able to actually like institute catholicism the way it should be but they don't realize how awful it actually was and so yeah it's um and so i think that's interesting too where we see a rise of catholic fascists on in the united states and um spain actually experienced a bit of that yeah and it was and it was pretty bad in a way that you're you're not allowed for a long while to be to be uh, an atheist basically or to you know you were always officially every, all children were were baptized i was baptized <laughs> mm -hmm. it was it became like a tradition ingrained tradition I'm, and i was born in 75 it's like uh i was born a few months before the dictator died you know and the whole thing blew off apparently wow. uh, that, which 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 is to apparently. be discussed yeah because you know this transition uh some of us argue that it's an, a very good example of continuism but that's mm. a, that's a different debate yeah <laughs> we, we could pull from that thread <laughs> enormously but in a way i think it comes from earlier on on, on spanish history And uh, the way that the 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 royalty in Spain, the kings and uh, the mostly the Bour the Bourbons, but also you know the Austrias and other royal families that have been trying to to keep the the Spanish territories, were very intertwined with the because it was the Middle Ages where you know religion and state were not a separate concept. It was everything you know. It was different. It was like before Enlightenment and and all the concepts before. Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, it was so super normalized that everything, you know, was one and the same, you know, church and state, of course, you know, there were popes who were uh, deciding uh, on the, uh, you know, Italian kingdoms and territories and everything who were taking, you know, part in politics. It was like, yeah, sure, it was, it was the normal thing, but it came, you know, it, it got it grabbed a little bit the monarchy, the royal families, and they, you know, they were partaking in all of the economic and, and political power in Spain. So it was but natural, you know, that these oligarchies who uh, made a coup d'etat in Spain were deeply attached to the, to the Catholic hierarchy, which, you know, doesn't mean that they were, I mean, most of them were very, uh, uh, let's say, Catholic in, in a very perverted way in a way that you know it's it's very common for a spaniard right winger to pray every sunday go to church you know every sunday and uh, but on saturday they go to the whorehouse or you know yeah. doing some cocaine and but hide yeah. it you know the problem is always that they catch you if you if they don't catch you it's not a problem you just confess if you want to things go things blow off you pay Of course, pay some, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you pay some some good, you know, money to your to your local priest, and local priest is going to forgive it, forgive everything, and you know, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a perversion of 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 what I was, you know, Catholic Catholicism was supposed to be, right? The whole Virgin Mary and the you know the, all of the let's say that the figure that, that is Virgin Mary, who is like made of absolute love and forgiveness and care. And, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, like this female figure that is all caring and all loving. And it, it, it's, a, it's a perversion because what they were doing is like being absolute hypocrites and, and normalizing mm -hmm. hypocrisy. So it was, but, but you know, very normal for for these uh, oligarchs who took power uh, to, took power in the in the coup d'etat that fo followed to an extermination war in in the 1930s in Spain in 1936 to 1939 and beyond because after they officially won the war they kept killing in prison and and uh, and exiling uh, Spaniards who were not agreeing with the with the official ideology it was but normal that the church was was along for the ride 
mm-hmm. basically because of, of yeah. power and hierarchies you know what i mean yeah i think that's interesting about mary how it could go from mary can be a comforting mother to all no matter who you are mm-hmm. to mary's gonna be your mother whether you like it or not and you also <laughs> and, and to to be under her authority means you have to be under all our authority too like the th- it's a very interesting leap. But it's kind yeah. of kind of it's kind of the Spanish mom type of thing. <laughs> She's very yeah. c- caring and loving, but when she has to take off the shoe and beat you up, she's gonna. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's funny. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a quite quite an interesting uh, concept by itself. And it, it really permeated into into our culture for sure. Yeah, and uh was, did, were you uh, going to church at all when you were young? No, no, because my, I was baptized because of my grandma. Mm-hmm. They, because he, he, um, people who lived under the quote unquote civil war that I like to say always, I'm, I'm going to, this is like a chorus for me already. I repeat it all the time, but it was not a civil war, but an extermination war that followed a mm-hmm. failed coup d'etat attempt, uh, attempt of coup d'etat. Mm-hmm. So uh, after that happened, uh, the days after the war f- were like incredible repression and in- incredible hunger, and people were basically in fear. So one of the one of the basic things that you could do is like keep, keep, keeping everything in line. Do not stand out. Obey all the rules. You know, otherwise they're gonna come after you. And that that feeling, that fear permeated in everybody who lived through that process, both the war and the post-war. So my grandma wanted to baptize me no matter what, even if after the fact, because my parents were like very leftists and, you know, were, they were really, I remember when I was four years old, uh, I I went to school and uh, uh, our teachers kept saying, you know, be, be a Catholic because that's the path to being a good person. And I was like, um, but that's does that mean that is it the only path to be a good person? I, I asked myself, right? So I asked my mom, do I have to be Catholic to be a good person? And she went like, nah, nah, not necessarily. <laughs> and I was like, okay, then I'm not a Catholic. <laughs> that, that was my yeah. first leftist moment, I guess. <laughs> four-year-old me being very confused by some you know brainwashed that some teachers were trying to do on us and it kind of backfired Uh, Mm -hmm. but but it's true that many you know many people who lived through through that era were like scared that if you don't conform uh, things would go bad and uh, and that uh, that really but I, i would i would blame that more on the barrel of a gun than anything else yeah it's interesting yeah <laughs> it was it was quite the quite the thing <laughs> yeah and there's still people there who thought oh that was great when that happened and we need to go back to that isn't there yeah back yeah. to yeah yeah. yeah yeah there's a common sentence which is con franco se vivía mejor it's like people live better under franco but <laughs> Because there's this image, you know, if you conform to the rules and if, if you if you do nothing, you know, that doesn't stand out, you have your job, you can pay for your house. And it's true, you know, capitalism, uh, let's say, punishes us in a different way. Yeah. But only if you conform to that, if you, if you said something slightly, you know, off, they would they would probably put you in jail or they would, you know, sentence you to death or they would torture you. You know, the, the people don't talk about that when they say con Franco se vivía mejor, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So in a way, you know, one of the one of the pre- prerequisites of the of the Francoist peace was uh, the whole massacre that happened under the civil war. The hundreds of thousands of people who were uh, killed, the millions who were exiled, and you know, whatever was left was people that were very scared and were very, you know. Uh, let's say wouldn't have a problem conforming and it's not the first time that 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 type of political or ethnic cleansing happened because it, it, these 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 types they worship also the catholic kings the isabel mm. and fernando isabel from castilla and fernando from aragon in a more nebulous time let's say in the middle ages when spain was not really formed but they they have like this myth that spain was formed on the 15th century when these two married 
and then Castilla and Aragon put together were actually the first uh, hint of the kingdom of Spain. But, you know, it was, it's very de de debatable and very disputed be between historians. But in the legend of these people, you know, these people are very high on their on their standards. So what the what the what they did was, um, you know, basically they threw the Jewish people out of the out of the country. They forced like a forced conversions, and uh, and um, I mean, you 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 either convert yourself, and if they caught you, you know, practicing uh, Jewish rituals, they would you know, execute you or, mm -hmm. or banish you. And most of them, you know, were just banished and they fled to Central Europe. And then, you know, that's how, you know, a lot of Central Europe is, was very Jewish in the 20th century because of all the mass migrations that happened during the 15th with these other very genocidal kings. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's, it's it's all kind of connected, if you know what I mean. Like uh, that's why you know during the civil war there were like a lot of. Uh, it's I think it's one of the images I have in some of my covers on social media. It's an image of a, of these priests with guns, you know, who were training during the mm. civil war or quote unquote civil war during the 1936 war and uh, extermination war <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, they they were training with their with their rifles and everything to 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 fight you know and there there were many accounts of 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 you know priests uh, fortifying themselves in their in their chapels and their churches and shooting from up uh, up from the bell tower you know people who they deemed to be politically not aligned with their cause you know to make some of the dirty work for the and there were, of course there were a lot of reports as well on the, on our side that many you know convents uh, were burned and uh, many many priests were also shot as well but again it was an all in war but it was very asymmetrical not like the, the, the if you check the official telling of the, of the of the thing the one that calls it civil civil war <laughs> it always goes like to the both sides argument but it's mm. it's more or less like like trump saying now fantastic <laughs> people on both sides you know what i mean yeah definitely so it's interesting yeah it, it's also i think it's interesting talking about like the violent history of spain collaborating with the catholic church but then i've also like um at times found myself fascinated with the history of spanish mystics mm -hmm. like you know saint Teresa of avila and mm -hmm. uh, juan de la cruz and i think uh and it, it's so weird because like reading their stories and their writings, it seems like there's no way they're actually in Spain. Like the Spanish Inquisition was going on during their lives. Mm -hmm. it, and it seems like we're reading two different um, realities. And so, so I've, I, yeah, I think I've been like interested in that too, of where um, like what was actually like happening within the, uh, in the air i guess and and among these mystics and i think part of it was this um seeing that a lot of their the, the catholic church became a lot about belief like you have to believe the right mm -hmm. way and be the right religion and these mystics found their faith through an experience and it wasn't so much about having all the correct beliefs but actually experiencing god and experiencing some sort of spirit and um and i think that's that's fascinating because i think uh some some of that like it's it's weird thinking how teresa avoided the inquisition but i think it, part of it was like because so much of it was focused on experience and she was able to just say yeah sure i believe whatever you, whatever you say you want me to believe anyway let me go back to the experiences i'm having and um another, and then, another slice of yeah. rye bread right <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh and so it's uh it's it's yeah it's just so weird how like um that can happen but i see that here too where people and i mean all over the place we see instances of that where whenever religion becomes about like domination and everyone thinking exactly the right way and everyone conforming yeah. you have other people who are like screw all this i need i'm just trying to have some sort of experience with the divine whatever that may look like and um 
Yeah, and I think I'm fascinated with both. Yeah, there was a lot of a lot of wiggle room. Mostly in the Middle yeah. Ages to probably the 19th century, there was a lot of wiggle room in the in the Catholic Church. And then we have that's why we have like people like uh, Arcipreste de Ita, who was writing a Libro de, del Buen Amor, the Book of the Good Love, in which he was he was very sexually explicit but very joyous of life. Very, very. Mm -hmm. He was a, a, a he was celebrating the joy of life. And you could argue that he was doing like a, it from a very honest, mystical point, and nobody came after him because I'm 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 under the impression that most of those you know Inquisition trials were more political than actually spiritual. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean, they used the spiritual in a very performative way to get political moves on people. But yeah. the, but some most of these most of these monks and nuns mostly uh, were were you know living alone in the middle of the countryside with their congregation doing art doing science at, in their own way you know doing do, basically developing their lives in a very in the most wholesome way they could so it for that matter they were like very harmless to the power structures but at the same mm -hmm. time they were making amazing literature and amazing you know advances in in both the the spiritual and the and the material plane right in the in the in the case of the good literature they they, they did left behind and and they, people have enjoyed after the fact right yeah definitely um and then it's also interesting that there's the uh, inquisition in mexico too and i, I was recently reading about these uh, mystics in Mexico who were put on trial, who were experiencing very similar things to like Teresa of Avila, like visions and um, and like shaking and feeling like possessed by some sort of spirit, yeah. and they were executed. They were put on trial and then executed for saying the same things that Spanish mystics were going through, and and even then it was like political because it was mixed with oh you're influenced by these evil uh, demonic indigenous religions and. Of so course. we have to get you out of here. And so it's like, it's so, so weird. It like, uh, and it also just makes me think like how, how much religious experimentation could have been achieved had it, had it not been for this, uh, dominant dom dominating type of Christianity that tries to stamp out any sort of religious experimentation. Yeah. 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 And she was deep. What a, what a poet. <laughs> What a poet! You know, I mean, it, did you did you manage to read it like in the original Spanish, or no? No, it, it, it translated to English. It's mm -hmm. it's 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 good stuff if 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 you can if you can handle it. It's it's a little bit dated the language, okay? So it's uh, sometimes it's a little bit you gotta really reach out, but it's really good stuff. And it comes from a tradition, you know, that was coming from from before, from from the times where you know Spain was uh, was actually under the influence of the of the little uh, Arab kingdoms in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the early middle ages where, where they want every, everybody, you could be either a Christian, uh, a Jew or, or an Arab or a, say, say, or a Muslim, sorry, Pff, bad conflation. And uh, you could be, you could, you could do any of the religions you wanted to do. You know, everybody was living under more or less a, you know, it was all right. It was not the best, but it was all right. There was certainly religious and cultural freedom and people thrived uh, like in the fields of arts. And that was a momentum that was preserved for many centuries after after the fact. So they, the, the thing is, you know, they were they were a little bit away from the power uh, structures, all the kings and their money grabbing and their you know, their conquest campaigns and uh, the supposed imperial Spain that was being lost, uh, you know, one country at a time, good. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, because they were being liberated one at a time. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it was a momentum of really uh, cultural thriving that was kept by these, these people who were, you know, it, throughout Europe, I would say, you know, the monks and nuns were the ones keeping the culture alive, doing all those copies from from books and making all, all all of the old school thing before before the printing press was invented and even after that you know they were preserving cultures copying a lot of books uh, making a lot of music that was you know there then he permeated outside uh, the the walls of those convents and those castles and they they went all the, the way to the people so it was it was 
it was a, it was a absolutely a different time, but it had like a lot of culture and influence. And I, I you know, when people talk about the about the Middle Ages being like the Dark Ages, uh, I I I'll, I listened to something recently. I don't remember what exactly where they say this great sentence that is like um, it. They're called the Dark Ages because of the lack of documents, the lack the lack of information <laughs> yeah. that historians have, not because they were actually dark in uh, the yeah. you know. but so you know talking about the middle ages it's it's it, there are hints that people were doing all right just, yeah definitely just it, things were different you know things were said in different terms and done in different ways you know we cannot analyze uh middle ages societies from a 21st century perspective because something's going to be lost in trans in translation there and most mm -hmm. of it I, guess, I would even say right so yeah yeah this this and has gone really interesting <laughs> sorry about that tirade. <laughs> yeah it is interesting well i think what was really interesting too is pointing out uh the inquisition was definitely political and um disguised as spiritual and i think all forms of like heresy hunting uh at the more digger you deep you realize or the deeper you dig, the, the realize that it's uh yeah, it's just a political game. And I think um like I think of certain countries were became Christian through colonization, and that was really to just expand the land of the empire that they came from and mm -hmm. uh, and saying that, oh, it's because we're trying to spread Jesus and you really need Jesus. Yeah. But then there's other cases like um, of the, the Christians that came over to Ireland and, uh, and mingled with the Celtic pagans, it didn't look like that. It was like, well, what do you guys uh, do day to day in, in your, um, in your uh, life with spirit or whatever? And they said, uh, well, we uh, have this day where we uh, celebrate the sun rising up and celebrate this, the, the world in general rising with the sun. And it's like we have similar uh, day of Easter. And so let's like try to combine our traditions and celebrate together and stuff. And so like Celtic Christianity is interesting because it still has some of that um, old pagan um, idea and there isn't as much contradiction there. And um and so, so it's like, it's interesting to think that there is, there are ways of like, um, the instances where people were able to take Christianity without the political agenda was always like not all that violent. And it was more like collaborative and it wasn't trying to just um, stamp out the other person's culture. But in the instances where it is violent and, and there are stamping out other person's culture, it's because of the political agenda tied to it. Definitely, definitely, yeah. definitely. It was, a, as, I, as I like to say, you know, a, a very clean and, and uh, honest way to read uh, religious thinking is, is cosmogony, a way to, to conceptualize the world, to understand the mm -hmm. world, a way to relate to the world. And that's what, what these spiritualities do by themselves without minus, you know, the political agenda. That's that I think, you know, it's hard, you know, because it, it's like on the one hand you go like, OK, then we should take politics away from religion. But it's it's not very it doesn't feel right either. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's all tied together. Yeah. I don't know how to, what to do with that. We, like like. I, because if you take politics away from religion, politics politics are not going away in a way, and and everybody's politics are going to affect their their beliefs, you know. So it's, it's complicated. Yeah, <laughs> I wish there it was is complicated. A simple <laughs> recipe, right, for it. <laughs> I just think I think we we all want people to stop using religion as an excuse for domination and imperialism and um and, and it's it's like i'd rather these people be honest like especially thinking of right-wing christians uh, or the republican party in um america how it's like there's there there's a lot of things that they do that say it's rooted in our christian values like for example um 
being allied with Israel because Israel's in the Bible and we have, then that's God's people. And we have to um, take care of Israel, protect Israel, and also be against neighboring nations that are against Israel. And then some even attach like end times stuff to it that um, in the, the Bible says that, which is when they say the Bible says they're tying together a bunch of random half verses together to form this narrative that Jesus will come back when the temple is rebuilt and when the entire land of Israel is restored. And so so that's what we're doing because we're Christians. When in reality, they're trying to protect the oil yeah. in the Middle East. That's what it all comes down to at the very, very bottom. And um, and it's like over here, I'd rather them just say that, that we, we're trying to protect the oil instead of being like, oh, this is the Christian thing to do. And then confusing all these Christians who think, oh, yeah, well, Israel's in the Bible. We got to protect Israel. And they, they don't even know that that was like a modern state. And um, and they don't know like uh, anything happening in Israel either. They have this like weird fantasy of like that's where Jesus lived. And it's um, they have no idea about the oil or anything. Almost role playing, right? Yeah, yeah role playing. <laughs> It's totally role playing, and even even more now that he, they can totally get away with it. We're in a very mask off type of uh, historical moment right now for the right, so they could go like, "Yeah, it's the old fuck off," you know. We're in power. F shut the fuck up. We, you know, they could totally get away with it right now. They don't have to pretend. But yeah, mm -hmm. the thing with and 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 the 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 motive is so nefarious. Like Israel is there in the in the Bible, therefore uh, we side with it, but. Israel was formed in the 1960s uh, because of the, you know, the treaty arbitrarily imposed by the UK uh, after World War II, saying, "Okay, we're we're gonna it's, this is this now, fuck off." And it's like for, since then they haven't stopped uh, expanding their territories, invading these poor people who are absolutely defenseless against. The, those incredible, the, that incredible alliance between the United States and 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 the Israel, right? Which is like, a, as you said, you know, like an, an oil police franchise to the United mm -hmm. States, basically. But yeah, you know, these Christians also have no idea that there's Palestinian Christians being persecuted by Israel. Right, they have on. no clue whatsoever. And uh, and there's even but Palestinian liberation theology. Um, by this guy named Naim Atik, who wrote a book called that, and it's um, and and it's people very much relating with Jesus, where Jesus was in occupied territory by the Romans, and um, and they couldn't practice their religion the way that they wanted to, and they had to uh, be subservient to the Roman religion, Roman gods, and and worshiping Caesar as God, and they so Palestinian Christians read that and relate and, and see that Israel is like Rome in their case, that's occupying their territory and, um, and won't leave them alone. And so there is, and so, so that's like totally a different reality. Like there is a way of looking at that situation from a biblical perspective or from a, a like more radical Christian perspective, but it, you wind up realizing that the Palestinians are like Jesus being occupied by Rome, not that we should side with Israel. And it just requires actually looking deeper into it. Yeah, yeah. And d damn the human rights, right? <laughs> yeah, that too, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> For it's, sure. It's crazy. It's, it's really crazy. It's really crazy. Uh, the way I see it, you know, we should just shut down quietly Israel, say, okay, it's not no more. It does, it's no more. <laughs> You're all Palestine now, okay? And mm. the the government ca can be secular, and everybody can be uh, 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 Christian, Jewish, uh, Buddhist, uh, Muslim, wh whichever they want. It's fine, you know. And and stop, you know, being the police for the United States anymore. And the United States is falling down. You know, it's on the it's on its way down. It's on. It's, they're grasping at straws right now to. <laughs> To, to keep it together, which is not not gonna happen. So I don't know. Could be could be a good thing, you know, to say okay, peacefully, easy, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. You're all now Palestine. Israel is no more. Just you know, keep your religious freedom. Do your thing. Uh, get on with each other, and be more democratic and stop the bigotry and all the bad stuff, right? <laughs> But you know, <laughs> one can wish. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, 
I, and I'm hoping that people could see um, the ways that the U.S. is completely um, like I mean, I, like national how 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 weird and messed up nationalist Christianity is in in the U.S. How it's a uh, like in in the book of revelation there's this stuff about christians being deceived by the beast uh, out of the sea or the antichrist and how mm -hmm. they would uh turn from jesus and follow him and be deceived by his great signs and wonders and um the in reality revelation is talking about a present reality faced by uh christians under caesar as well under mm -hmm. nero caesar and domitian caesar and so so when they would have read that they wouldn't have thought, oh, this would be really helpful for some Christians 2,000 years from now. They would have been like, oh, yeah, this is what we're experiencing right here, right now, where certain Christians are deceived by the signs and wonders of Caesar and are turning away from Jesus because of that. And so so, so I, I see Revelation as prophecy, and but I see prophecy as something that's so true about that present society that it remains true generation after generation after generation. It's always true to, to describe something that we all go through. And so I think that's something that has always happened. People being um, allured by these uh, great emperors and kings and rulers and turning away from this actual radical message of Jesus. So anyway, in the evangelical world, they make they literalize the whole book of revelation and say it's all future and it's all gonna happen later and they say things like uh so in the future an antichrist singular figure is gonna come and all these christians are gonna be deceived so you have to make sure that you stay in your word and stay um tied to jesus and committed to this thing and stay wise and make sure that you never get deceived when this happens um and it's gonna happen soon so uh, my parents actually have have talked about how and because they 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 started going to church when I was two and um, they were like very like fundamentalist Christian in my early childhood and they've kind of gotten more and more open over the years but they uh, have talked about how before they used to wonder how how is that going to happen how are Christians actually going to be deceived how are Christians actually going to like because this is like the the antichrist how could people be that deceived and then trump became president and they're like oh that's how that's what it <laughs> looks like all of these christians who are like totally um in a like trumpist cult and it's like oh that's exactly what it looks like for christians to just totally let go of their original principles and values for this great leader with his great signs and wonders and in order to grow an empire it kind of works, and it, like in a, in a way, it could be like these things. I, mean, I, I don't I don't think we can treat uh, literature that was written in the year one hundred uh, the same as we would treat a blog post that was written yesterday. Yeah, for sure. So in a way, it's like uh, maybe they were trying. I don't know. Maybe they were trying uh, to describe a power dynamic that can be you know re repeated. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that how history it doesn't really repeat exactly, but it kind of rhymes, as somebody says that mm -hmm. in the thing. I love that sentence. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, this, this uh, mm, you know, like a Michel uh, uh, of Nostradamus was, mm, some people tried to say, like, he was not trying to make predictions, and it was like a way earlier case than actually the Bible. I mean, way earlier, way later, way, way closer to us, right? But in a way, Michel of Nostradamus, what, was, who, who, what he was trying to do was math. Some scholars say that he was trying to do math with words. So in a way mm -hmm. that he, he could, you know, practice math without having been, you know, prosecuted for it because he lived in difficult times. It's hard to say. There are, you know, interpretations are open and most of those texts are so old and have been translated over and over so many times, but it's difficult to to say you know take this literally and and go with it literally. I don't I don't I don't. Something tells me that it shouldn't be intended to be treated like that. If you know what I mean. Yeah, in order to read the Bible, for me, it's about reading the Bible seriously and responsibly, and in order to read it seriously and responsibly, that means 
that you can't read it literally, or you have to read it. I've, I've heard some people say, read it literally, be <laughs> able to realize what you're reading and realize, okay, this is a poem. This is um, a song. This is a metaphor. This is a collective memory and realize the nature of ancient sacred texts and be able to approach it that way. Like, I, I think what's really important for people to realize when approaching like a sacred text like the Bible and written back then is um, that they were way more concerned with the why of events than exactly the details and the how and everything. So they would absolutely get all kinds of details historically wrong, yeah. but that wasn't the point. And, um, and today we have like the complete opposite, the way we tell stories, like we could talk about like the way 9-11 was talked about. It was like, okay, we have um, two planes crash at this time and this area, this amount of people died. And that's the story and totally miss that there's some people in the Middle East that have some serious problems with us and, uh, and, and why and what the United States has done in Iraq in order to uh, cause that disdain. And so... It's like there's a complete um, disconnect with the why and the way we tell we report stories now. But back then it was purely about exactly the why is this happening? What is the larger meaning? And um, and then if you were to hear one of these uh, early stories when it was transmitted orally initially and then ask, yeah, but did it really happen that way? They wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about because yeah. they didn't approach it that way. Because it didn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, I, I think I read it somewhere. Th this book about journalism, I don't even remember about because I'm really bad at remembering details. Maybe I'm from the Bible times myself. <laughs> But said something around journalism, you know, being so immediate now that you see things unfolding live and they overwhelm mm -hmm. you a little bit. So they kind of uh, take away some of your critical thinking skills. Like yeah. back in the day, uh, talking about maybe 1960s, 70s, journalism was done with an editorial purpose. And the work of the, the job of the journalist was not just only witnessing the events, but putting the events in context. So people mm. would understand the context and why things happen, not just how things happen or just see things happening, unfolding out, uh, 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 you know right in front of, of their eyes I, and it it happened i had like that kind of shock not long ago you know with the things unfolding right now in uh, in belarus mm -hmm. and i was seeing all the all the protests and all the stuff out of context and i didn't know what to think and some people told me you know that lukashenko was a piece of shit and i was like okay but are these people you know considering what happened in maidan in 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 ukraine not long ago that where they had like a lot of those Nazis involved and everything. So I, I didn't know what to think. I was overwhelmed by the thing happening and I didn't know, should I express solidarity with these people or, or maybe I should uh, uh, reject what these people had. I didn't even, I couldn't, I felt powerless. Like it was mm -hmm. unfolding in front of my eyes, but I didn't have any context. I didn't have any information. I knew Luka, Lukashenko himself was a dick. But is the system that, you know, Lukashenko is using, could it be used in another? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I just, I can just, you know, imagine things, but I don't have the power or I don't feel authorized or, or to, to, to position myself against it. And it's, it was very frustrating. I don't know if it's an, yeah. expa and it's an example only, but. Yeah. I think a lot of people could definitely relate with that. That, yeah, we're, we're overwhelmed with information and don't know what to do with it. And, um, and the context is really important for sure. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's good to approach those very old books with, uh, with that other lens. You know, them as you, you pointed out yourself, that most of those stories were transmitted orally from mm -hmm. older stories. You know, you never know. And I, I, I don't know if you ever played this game when you're sitting like in a, in a circle with friends and somebody says something to the ear and when it gets to the other side, the, 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 the last one's got to say out loud whatever it was said and was totally the opposite, right? So yeah. with, with complex stories and narratives, what could happen through generations, right? <laughs> you could even see that in the Bible itself, like in uh, uh, Samuel, I think, Second Samuel, uh, something like that, uh, talks about David, the King David, um, 
counting like like after some sort of battle um being told by god to count the people and um and so he counts them and then he's punished for it by god and i guess maybe he did it with the wrong motivation it's kind of a confusing story but then in chronicles it it uh tells a lot of the same stories that were in there but it's like much much later that these stories are told and so they tell them differently and it says the same story there it says satan told king david to count the people <laughs> and then he's punished for it and so it's like both those stories are in the bible and the the people who curated this stuff knew that yeah. it's it's they totally knew <laughs> that there were contradictions and um that things didn't exactly fit together but they saw it as like here's this larger story we're trying to tell which of course includes contradictions and um and and inc and, and that is uh showing that they were concerned with larger truth which i think was uh totally even the idea of the concept of truth was viewed completely differently before the enlightenment um like after the enlightenment the truth became well can it be proved can it be lined up with scientific evidence and before that truth was i think more about um what does it say about like the larger narrative that we're a part of and um and something was able to be true without like capital t true without being literally true like like the story of adam and eve uh, of these people who are given uh, the gift of this garden and food and animals and told uh, that you can't eat from this one tree. Um, do not take advantage of this place by doing this one thing. And then they, they do it anyway and they're kicked out. That is um, a pattern that a lot of people go through. And Israel went through that where they're given a land, told here's the, the law, the commandments, do not break them. They break them, they're kicked out of the land into exile. And there, and then we all experience like we're given the gift of life. But of course, in order to keep this gift, we have to make sure that we do certain things and not take advantage of other things. And if we miss that, then we can end up losing um, what we have. And so the story of Adam and Eve is true, not because it happened, but because it happens all the time. Yeah. And so the way of learning, right? Le learning by making mistakes. That's, yeah, that's us. Exactly. That's our, mm -hmm. our human nature. It's like kind of a way to come in peace with the way we are, right? Yeah, definitely. And so, so there's definitely uh, truth beyond literal facts and um, historical events, I think, is very interesting. And we have to still, uh, I, th I think we, we can still engage with that. Even people who consider themselves full 100% materialists, um, I only believe what's in front of me and this is all there is, they can still benefit from engaging with these um, stories and metaphors and images and symbols. Um, they just approach it differently and uh, with more of a, a critical lens, but it's, I think it's still beneficial. Yeah, being a, being a little bit a little bit less literal and more mm -hmm. more introspective, I would say, even re reflexive. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's that's all part of critical thinking, and in a way, you know, it's a it's a very intuitive way of of performing metaphysics. For instance, in the in the case that you you know you put there, it's it's, it's a very intuitive way yeah. of of playing metaphysics. How we are, how we behave, the way we are. Do we have to be like this? What can we do about it? It gets you thinking. It gets your gears going. And that's that's a fantastic thing. Yeah. And I think what's funny about when you bring in metaphysics and uh, just my barely any little tiny bit of reading of the history of metaphysics, what I thought was interesting was the beginning of metaphysics seemed to be seemed to intentionally leave room for mystery. Mm -hmm. And it was about this is a, a practice for us to engage in these thoughts beyond our material reality to help us grow and become more contemplative. And and of course, there are things that we'll never understand. We'll ask these questions knowing that we'll never get the answers. It just helps us understand reality itself. And then post enlightenment, it seemed like metaphysics was, oh, we actually can figure out answers to everything. <laughs> Darwin figured out uh, a, a natural selection and evolution. Marx figured out the economy. Yeah. Actually, every single question we have can be answered as long as you give us enough time. 
<laughs> and so I think that totally like uh, turned metaphysics into something completely different and also like took away what what uh, the, the old possibility of being able to accept that mystery is a part of life and that's okay and we'll never have the answers to everything and there's certain things that we'll never know and that's okay and we can explore it together and be contemplative about it and shoot the shit about it and have a drink over it and that's all right um instead of this like oh no we we can i can give you an answer for every single thing just give me enough time give me enough evidence give me enough studies then i'll give you the answers to absolutely everything like that's that's not <laughs> fun yeah that's that's not gonna happen uh, that's something that we as as individuals need to accept is that we don't know stuff and it's it's fine we can we can the 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 search itself to try and figure out stuff it's it's a lot of fun why are we going to deny us that that search right <laughs> but for yeah, that exactly. for that you got to admit in the first place that you don't know stuff <laughs> it's a difficult yeah. step to take right it's it's you know i i'm saying it all the time because you know i'm trying to really get rid of my ego and through well, Personally, I'm going through a depression and whatnot, you know, which is mm -hmm. fucked up because it, it really destroys your self-image. So for that, I'm trying to get rid of my ego. So my self-image doesn't matter anyway. So. <laughs> But I think yeah. it's a good exercise. Like, uh, I don't have to be afraid not to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to be afraid not to know something. And mm -hmm. uh, that's like lifting a burden from, from you of absolute insecurity, anxiety, and bullshit. It's like, The hell if I know. You tell me. It's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But that's... It reminds me of uh, the, this philosopher Peter Rollins talks about the, the ways that we uh, approach someone that we disagree with at times could be, for, first of all, what we commonly see is I'm right and you're wrong. And so I have to consume you and try to change you into believing exactly how I believe. And then there's the approach of I'm right and you're wrong and... I uh, spit you out and completely avoid you and will never communicate with you because of our disagreement. And then there's the approach of I'm right and you're right too. We just see things from different angles and we're able to come to some agreements. But in all of those, I'm right. And then there's this approach he talks about where we both are able to say, um, you know, I'm not even really sure about my beliefs and my positions and I'm just exploring and I could be wrong. And you're able to see not just the other person as like with strange beliefs and positions and, but you're able to see yourself as also with strange beliefs and positions and can say, we're both wrong and we're both trying to figure this out together. And I think that's way more humble. And the other person is willing to let their guard down a little bit when two people are able to be like, you know, sometimes I'm actually not sure about my position on this. The other person could be like, no, sometimes I'm not sure either. And then you can actually have an honest conversation. Right on. It may seem as if essentialism was a very <laughs> controversial stance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear you completely. Oh my, this is, this is, this is so good. I love this conversation. I'm learning a lot. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. I'm so learning a lot too from you. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, uh, I was looking forward to hang out with you, man. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, we, It's cool that you're streaming on Twitch now. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm trying this out. It seems to work. Then I put, post the thing on YouTube and it seems to work, which is, you know, it's fine. I'm, I'm glad. And, and the level in the chat is incredible. Like they're, they're citing Her Herodotus and Tacitus <laughs> Germania, you know. Wow, it's it's good good stuff. Uh, so I'm I'm so I'm so good. I I really love how our conversations tend to go very deep. Very, mm -hmm. uh, I love this. Let's do more of this. <laughs> yeah. Where to now? <laughs> I uh, I uh, let me think. You let me know I because think... I could go forever. I'm I'm so happy right now. I just wanted to point it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're happy. Yeah, I. I think, uh, yeah, Twitch, Twitch is interesting. Have you, have you gotten any, um, any like trolls in chat before? No, no, people, I got all the nicest people in here. I'm, I guess maybe uh, because, because I don't have that many subscribers anyway in a, that traction. So we, we cultivate really, really nice spaces with all the best people. I mean, yeah. 
really Herodotus that's <laughs> that's I mean right on yeah definitely awesome people yeah uh, yeah yeah I like that too I like being able to um being able to cultivate a community where people are able to learn and grow together and I think one of the greatest feelings that I, that I have is connecting people through my stuff, like people meeting each other through my chat and then like becoming friends and really liking each other's ideas and liking talking to each other. I think, I think that's the coolest thing ever that I could provide for people. Um, not just a place where people can get into what I talk about, but into what each other talks about. Yeah. And um, I think that's really fun to be a part of. Oh, somebody posted No Pasarán on the chat. You see, that's that's how good it is. No Pasarán. <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, that's uh, They Shall Not Pass. It was the the the, the slogan oh. of the of the um, of the um, re, uh, let's say Republican defenders, but it was mostly anarchists, to be honest, in Madrid. And they they never passed. They never, you know, during the quote unquote civil war, that was actually an extermination war uh, <laughs> done by fascists after a failed coup d'état. It's, I'm I'm getting better at saying it like in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When that happened, you know, they see they siege Madrid and they tried to take it over at the beginning of the of the war, and it was a war that lasted like in 36 to 39, so it was a few years of punishment, and uh, they never they, they they never made it. All the people in Madrid, all kinds of civilian people, everybody got organized to to resist the the the, the troops. And it was heavy. It was uh, it was people the, 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 because the 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 fascists they had like a lot of budget because they were funded by all kinds of the the richest people in Spain basically, and uh, they had like a lot of people from the army in the beginning. Like ha the army practically sli sli split in half, like the loyal people and the and the disloyal people. And sometimes you know if if you were like a some Randall you know who was serving in the army because you that was your job and your general was one of the of the evil guys there's nothing you could do about it and you were fighting you know in the wrong side because you fell there it was really fucked up and mm -hmm. um but they also on top of that they had support from uh, italy the fascist italy and uh, nazi germany so they brought like troops uh, airplanes tanks all kinds of shit right But what the left, uh, or let's say the, our, the, our, our side of the, of the conflict had was um, um, basically people organized. Most of the, most of the best f fighters were uh, uh, milicianos, which were basically people, you know, who were, I don't know, construction workers or, or I don't know, you know, regular folks who got organized and, and tried to, to put up a good fight. And Madrid always resisted. It was sieged brutally by the fascists, and it, uh, Madrid always resisted until the the war was declared over, and people stood down and they passed, and they they did a, a good cleanup in the city. To be honest, there were they shot a lot of people in the in the walls of the cemeteries and buried them right there. A lot of people are on the on the side on the sides of the roads and everything on the curbs and whatnot. It was, yeah, it was tough. Mm. So no pasarán was the slogan of the people resisting in Madrid. And yeah, they didn't pass and until the war was over, and and they had to. But that's, that's awesome. yeah, that's that. I got I got very excited. You know, it goes, <laughs> goes straight it's to not... my potato. One of one of the things I'm making right now, it's uh, it, it's uh, uh, I'm, I'm making I'm covering protests, which by the way I'm I should be editing one of them. Uh, I'm covering protests uh, happening in Madrid lately. Lately, so I'm go I go out with my camera. And I film it like from the side of the, from the per point of view of, of the protester. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of the protests was against the monarchy, was very well organized. And they hung the poster, the No Pasaran poster uh, on, on the same historical place as, the, as in, as in the, the original picture in, from, from, from the war. There was a place mm -hmm. in uh, near Plaza Mayor in one of the exit the streets in Arco de Cuchilleros it was. And there was, there were, It was hanging almost in the same place, and uh, we, we we were joking around. Where I met a friend at the at the protest, and we were hanging out while I was filming, and we were talking. 
And when we were approaching Plaza Mayor, we were like, oh, just, yeah, the place where, where, the, where the No Pasarán banner fame, from the famous picture well, it was here on the left, right? And then the, the protest take the, the, to, the detour to the left and then we saw it hanging there. It goes like, ah, <laughs> had a fun moment. <laughs> It was so much fun. Uh, <laughs> and it is there is there in the video is fun. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that's that's really uh it's really cool to experience being like in the middle of those protests and uh you experience a kind of solidarity that and and through that solidarity a kind of love that you don't feel anywhere else. Um yeah. there there's I think um, I, I've been thinking about that too. I think it's interesting. At the very beginning, you said how you, you're sometimes envious of people who have these like spiritual feelings and experiences because uh, you haven't. And I relate to that because I've grown up in situations where people like will be in a church and they say, okay, everyone, do you feel the spirit? And I didn't. Or people like, okay, right now, everybody, I need everyone to bow their heads and pray and ask God for a message. And I didn't hear anything. And everyone around me was like, I heard something. And part of it, I'm sure, is I'm just like really honest and skeptical. And I don't want to like pretend I'm hearing something that I'm not, pretend I'm feeling something that I'm not when others would be like, well, yeah, I felt a little something. I guess it's that. And uh, so I think that's part of it. But also, I think it's about just the type of person I am that I happen to, I think, really experience some sort of transcendent spiritual feelings when I'm with people and in, in crowds and um, instead of like by myself and looking inward and trying to access some other world by myself. But when you're like at a protest and everyone around you is in absolute solidarity and committed to this thing together and committed to fighting for each other and dying for each other, it's like, Oh, this feels this feels way beyond just my individual human experience. There's something else going on here. And uh, the liberation theologian James Cone, uh, in his book, uh, which was it, The God of the Oppressed, he talks about he in a, just a real quick throwaway sentence. He says, "God," and he says, "is the one whom the people meet in their struggle for freedom." So it's like. God is something that is experienced when we come together and actually fight for liberation. And um, and in that, we're able to realize, okay, there's something else going on here. There's something bigger beyond ourselves that connects all of us together that is experienced when we're able to be in solidarity with one another. And, and it's funny, like I've heard some people say, uh, usually people who come from like church backgrounds, they'll say that when they go to a protest or a march or something like that, they said, it feels it feels kind of like church and not only does it feel like church but it feels more like church than church ever did and so i think and so i thought of that too when you you read uh no pasaran it's like oh that touches you like deep inside yeah, there's something yeah. there and so i think that's like touching on a certain aspect of a religious impulse that doesn't get talked about a lot because often religion is so much about the individual experience and yeah. individually communicating with something else when it's like often spirituality is experienced among the people in events like this. Yeah. 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 It's, I think we we see connection and that mm -hmm. connection elevates us in a way, in a very abstract, we could even say spiritual way. Uh, we seek each other. We seek connection all the time. That's that's one of the things that we're doing here, right? Besides, besides of, of course, obvious leftist propaganda and say, <laughs> oh, propaganda. Yeah, we're we're trying to help. OK, we're trying to help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's too many Alex Joneses out in the world. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to help, okay? But besides that, we're connecting to these very nice people in the chat. We're connected to to each other, you know, we're talking, we're hanging out. And I have to apologize to the people in the chat because that's a very asymmetrical uh, type of relation where I can talk and talk and you just have that little box when you can type and that sucks. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm going to apologize every single stream for it because... <laughs> I feel that it's so asymmetrical and so so evil in the way that it is structured, you know. But uh, I'm I, we're here, we're connecting, we're we're fine. <laughs> yeah, 
And that's that's a fantastic thing. That's something that we all, I, I guess we all, almost all of us at, at least strive for, that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, we could call it a rainbow connection. Just don't, <laughs> don't mistake it for Jordan Peterson. Go for Kermit. <laughs> Always for Kermit. Kermit, good. Jordan Peterson, bad. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, that that's cool that you uh, admit that there there is a bit of a different dynamic where you are speaking and speaking and speaking, and they have the chat. I think uh, people <laughs> should be more responsible. I was talking about this with Zan Z, how th when people speak, they should realize that they're this, and especially on a platform like this, you give yourself a platform, you invite all these people to listen to you speak. Uh, you are speaking with an authoritative voice, whether you admit it or not. And yeah. there is, um, and because of that, we have to be more responsible with the things we say. And I have, um, I think you, you, you could probably relate to this. I've been thinking about this more lately. The difference between the way I approach social media and others seem to do, other leftists seem to do, to where I see social media as a platform um, to like share these ideas that I want to give to the world. And that is why I'm on social media. If I wasn't making these videos and streams or anything, I would be off social media. I wouldn't have any social media at all. Um, and, and so therefore, I, I'm intentional with the way I use it. And I don't use social media to share my feelings, which I think is kind of weird. I don't relate with that. When I see like leftist content creators using it to be like, I just need to vent to y'all. And often that ends up getting them in trouble because they word things weird. And they're like, wait, are you saying this? And they're like, no, I was just trying to like vent some feelings. And it's like, no, you're being bigoted in this way. Or like, no, I was trying to get my thoughts out. And I'm thinking... You probably should have hit up a friend and got those thoughts out instead of posting it all over this public platform. But uh, but I feel like I said I think you can relate to that because you also seem to be very intentional with the way you use social media I and try. your platform. I try. Yeah. I, but I'm guilty as charge of sharing my feelings <laughs> because I'm a, I'm I'm a, sometimes I get like emotional and there's no one around and they're like I'm gonna post this shit. Uh, I'm so <laughs> sad. It suck. <laughs> But because I, I think I suck all the time because of this depression really is it's like a very heavy weight on top of you that you cannot shake off and it sucks. But yeah, yeah, I try to make some useful posts. Mostly sometimes when I'm sitting on a bus and I'm, I'm going to I get some train of thought going like, hmm, this could be useful. And I, I try to ask myself those questions. And yeah. I, unless I'm in one of those emotional birds when I'm, I really fuck it up. And I agree with you that it's highly responsible to do that. So I'm going to try to do it a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes it's okay. I think, I think I'm more thinking of like the people who will like emotionally call someone out um, as a way of like, because they can't, like before even thinking about it. I don't know. I think there's just like... Um, times where we see like drama go down and people like being very uh not not actually contemplative with what they're trying to say and just saying whatever comes to their mind first and not looking into things and and it's interesting to like see my timeline filled with that and then also notice the certain people who I know see it but aren't joining in and it's like yeah we don't need to join it. Yeah, we have more important things to do and yeah, talk yeah. about. It. No it's drama, like... only wholesome stuff. Like if you see <laughs> yeah, someone, exactly. I posted this video and then I publicly say, you did a great job. You rock. You're fantastic. That mm -hmm. That's my type of social engagement with, with other mm -hmm. creators or, you know, even people. I did this thing today and I went for groceries and, and this happened to me. And say, hey, sending a hug and very good vibes and be well. And, you know, you... I'm I'm with you there. Even when I'm not physically there, I'm in you know in spirit. I'm with you there. So you know that kind yeah. of because Twitter, for instance, as a as an example, is a, it, its mechanics are designed for you know to reward you to be shitty. If you make a very controversial yeah. statement where people are gonna disagree with you, you're gonna get a lot of engagements and a lot of likes from the people who 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 are on board and a lot of replies from the people who are against. 
then you're mm-hmm. rewarded for that with your little dopamine shake from the all the interactions. And then it's like, <sighs> but how can I? I always do like to ask myself before I post something, unless I'm in the, which I'm going to try to avoid because you're absolutely right on that. <laughs> but my general rule is like, is this useful? Is this going to help someone? And if it does, if it's useful and it's going to help someone, then I post it. Mm-hmm. I think it's a good rule of thumb, general. Yeah, you can totally break if you need to, but is yeah. this useful? And we can is post gonna... memes and stuff too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. Which, which I think is, is a way of uh, helping people cope with this dark reality and lift spirits is posting jokes and memes as well. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Post a, uh, like many people do, images of cats and stuff being being, <laughs> being the funny uh, little quadrupedal friends they are. Go for it. Go crazy. <laughs> and useful things. You know, I had this thought, you know, mostly when I'm on a bus, I'm riding a bus and it's the same bus every, every you know, every day and it's the same thing. And, and you go like, oh, damn, I came up with this thought. Maybe this is useful. That, 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 mm-hmm. And I st- start writing this train of thought maybe this and that and they make these long threads <laughs> try and put it like the best way possible with the least typos and i hope it and then people come in and engage and go like oh i think i like this or i may maybe disagree on that and and go like oh wow, good good point you did you know try to make it into at, with the same respect that you would have for someone who's standing right in front of you and and saying you know that could if if you're especially shitty they could turn uh, turn around and walk away or even slap you in the face if you if you're extremely shitty and they would be right so you go all respectful all the and and it doesn't come through sometimes sometimes you succeed sometimes you fail <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know it's a uh, i would say it's a good practice when you fail to come out in the right way is to say no 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 i didn't mean it like that i failed to communicate this sorry 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 yeah, mm-hmm. so, so it's not like you misunderstood, you little shit. No, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry that I, you know, it's then then it's it's all good, but <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying. And then and then I think over time people understand that when I when I uh, look at Javi's page or the YouTube channel or the Twitch stream. I'm not going to see all this drama that I'm annoyed by right now. And that's what's happened to me too, is a couple of times people will like show up in my Twitch chat being like, I'm just so glad to be here and listen to you talk about something else other than <laughs> what the drama is going on right now. The latest and, uh, in the discourse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so good. Um, and something else that I'm thinking of, like when I'm saying all this is seeing certain people, uh, within the Christian space growing platforms where I, there's a lot of people I'm sort of connected to this space of progressive Christians who left conservative evangelicalism, not, not necessarily have anything to do with politics, but there are like uh, Christians who are just like more socially progressive and um, critique conservative evangelicalism and stuff. And so I'm, um, so I've gotten some, people within my following from those online worlds. And so I see some of those people, it's really disappointing to see that they they use their entire platform just criticizing evangelicals and conservative Christianity. And it's like, it deserves to be criticized, but that when it's just your entire platform, I think a lot of people wind up feeling like, okay, then what do you want to do then? Or what do you think is good? We know what you think is bad. What do you think is good? What do you think is a good thing to do? What do you think is a good type of Christianity or a good type of religion or a good type of humanism? What is good to replace it? Because what they end up doing is through their platform of critiquing uh, conservative Christianity, a lot of people find their work because they're questioning conservative Christianity too. And they're, they're like in a, in a conservative church and feeling weird and thinking and questioning. And then they look up stuff online and then they'll find someone with a platform that all they do is critique conservative Christianity. And then it ends up encouraging them and empowering them and they leave their community, which means they lost a whole bunch of friends. And now they're looking for something else. 
and that that person that encouraged them and empowered them to leave has nothing to offer them now. And that's like really sad for me to see. And I see that a lot with uh, certain progressive Christian uh, creators and influencers. And I I really don't want to do that. And so, so yeah, I'll, I'll criticize uh, conservative Christians and Christianity and talk about uh, debunk certain theological perspectives, but I also want to talk about something affirmative, something that people, some things that I think are good that people can attach themselves to, um, so that be- yeah. because th- this is like really serious and we, we have to take responsibility for platforms like this and realize we are encouraging people to leave old ideas behind, leave old communities behind, and we have to like uh, help direct them towards something new as well. Yeah, I feel like like you know. You could pull it off individually, like uh, to make a, a channel about criticizing, whether whether it's to be honest, you know, the shitty right wing evangelical types, but also dunking on chuds, you know, which is a, a, a very popular blood sport on on the on the internet. You can specialize on that; it's it's feasible, but it's, it's gonna take a toll on you personally. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're going to fall into those patterns. But as a movement, we need to have, you know, people who are really good at dunking on charts, but also people mm-hmm. who are really good at at at, at uh, exciting people's imaginations on, on what could be better and motivating people into why well, yeah, actually we're, you know, we're we're on the right path here and this is a convincing thing. So it's good at a personal level to keep it balanced, to give a little bit of positive and uh, and uh, do a little dunking on them chuds because mm-hmm. it's 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 yeah. low hanging fruit and it's fun. Yeah. Let's 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 face it, it's For low sure. hanging fruit. But you know, at a personal level, it's very it's better it's way better to have a balance there. Um, like let's try and 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 you know like like it's more or less like the revolutionary movements they have they need to have like a destructive uh movement that really tears apart the the oppressive structures yeah but it has to have it must have there's no other way around it otherwise the revolution is going to fall apart it needs to have a constructive movement that builds the new structures that help people get better because mm-hmm. You can't have one without the other and have like a anything that it resembles uh, remotely a uh, success, right? So I, I I hear what you're getting at. Like uh, personally, as a person, you're 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 gonna you need balance, and more importantly, as a movement, we need also that balance. We need to have a little bit of destructive and constructive, because those are the two tasks to change the world. You 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 take apart the things that harm. And then build the, the the things that heal and that that uplift people, right? More or yes. Or less. It's, it's, it could have Definitely. like two layers of analysis there, you know, the personal and the and the collective analysis. Um, yeah, and and I and I think uh, it's it's interesting. Um, sometimes, like there needs to be a reason for. Um, I think yeah, de- deconstructing things or uh, debunking things and dunking on things. It's like there has to be. I, I think a lot of people do 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 it well when they're able to say like, "There's potential here for truth," and they totally missed it, <laughs> and or they totally are deceiving people. They're totally trying to pull people away from something good and true, um, and so I think it's like we're we're trying to get people to to be more truthful to care about one another more and that's why we we cri- criticize or critique or debunk it's because we we wish that more people could see things this way we wish that more people would be more uh, thoughtful and considerate and caring for one another and these narratives are working against that and that's why we uh, fight against it because of our principles underneath all of this and um yeah i think that's important to have yeah we we it's a mix of enthusiasm because ah we have solutions <laughs> we, this is useful let's share it with people let's have people on board because this is good stuff and and the fear of shit everything that's wrong with the world and these motherfuckers they keep advancing further and further digging us deeper into the shit so it's it's a mix of the two 
<laughs> and for and for that we need the mix of the other two, the constructive and the and the destructive elements of of the revolution. It's 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 a response to both of those dynamics broadly because that everything is you know wibbly wobbly timey wimey like the Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very simplified way to to describe the very complex uh, and nuanced ways of 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 personhood and societies, which are so difficult to fathom completely but that's how we operate that's why we operate collectively because yeah we together are an unstoppable force but mm -hmm. we alone we alone we're just the, this one person who has some good things to do but by themselves not going to change anything so mm. yeah that's interesting and but even by ourselves we often have more to say than we realize um then that's what i've seen like people who start on youtube or twitch or wherever feeling like well there's all these other people that have all this other good stuff to say i don't have much to say i'm just me and then you realize there's a lot that you know that other people don't know right you on. just are used to all the information in your head because you're in your head all day every day and uh but when you start speaking it you, you, I wind up running into people who's like, oh, I never heard that before. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting perspective. So I think we need to remember that too. Or it's like, and, and that, that's been fun for me to realize where I, I um, it's some, something that really shifted for me with videos uh, about a year and a half ago was this fe feeling like before a year and a half ago, I would make videos with the mindset of here's something that I'm interested in learning right now. And so let me read up on it and research on it so I can make a video on it. And, but that ended up being, I would put out a video like every great big once in a while. And, uh, and I wasn't putting out videos as consistently as I wished I could. But then I, I shifted to what are things that I already know that other people may not know, or it would be helpful to others. And then I started busting out all kinds of videos based on that idea. And so there's like so much. That, yeah. That we, Sometimes we it's just a different angle, up. a different angle to, to, yeah, to, 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 you know, offer to people. It's, it's, my angle is a little bit different than everybody else, but check it out. I hope it's useful. Mm -hmm. That's valuable as, as, as hell, you know, that's fantastic. Yeah. And and there's people that you may think, well, so and so is saying this too, and so and so is saying that too, but there's people that are going to end up watching you say it because they like hearing you say it, and they may not like watching those other people that you've know that have said that before. Yeah. Um, so that's fun too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, our diversity is a. Uh, it, it sounds like a very worn out phrase, but diversity is a strength. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a lot of us making content out there, but there's a lot of people watching and you know listening to content out there too. And everybody's different, and everybody's got a different angle. But you know, well, we also work together. It's it's complicated. Again, mm -hmm. wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. But, <laughs> but you, yeah, you get my drift. <laughs> I do. Yeah, definitely interesting <laughs> times. Uh, but yeah, um, what else? What else we got? Or, or did anybody in the chat got anything? Any questions for us? Yeah, let us know. Let us know. Let's 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 catch up with the with the chat. I think uh, Darian Sapiens, you linked to my channel to Cunha Izquierdas, which I think it's the right one. I think so. Oh, it's saying you have. Channel translations, yada yada, yeah, yeah, but it's all my videos there. Okay, okay, okay. I other me from the past. Shut up. We're talking that right now with Damon. <laughs> oh yeah, I never seen that. Why does it say that? A leftist loudmouth. Yeah, because uh, in in Spain, it, translated like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I think it, uh, that's how I translated it for my videos because uh, uh, a cuñado it's like a brother-in-law, but uh, the in our Spanish slang, uh, it's like that brother-in-law that shows to shows up to family dinners and won't shut up, even <laughs> even when he doesn't know shit about shit. And they're usually they're right wingers, right? They're reactionary. Yeah. You know? 
You know, the, the type of low-key reactionary who doesn't militate, who is not militant, but he has all the talking points from the right, very interiorized, right? So I was, I came up with, uh, why, why don't we make like a leftist side of that? And I started the channel with that idea of the, of the guy that talks too loud, too fast, uh, but makes right wing points instead of, uh, I mean, left wing points of, instead of right wing points. So it started like that and then, then it evolved into something else. But it, the name is still that and you know, why not? Cuña Izquierdas, you know? And so I, I translated it into a leftist loud mouth because a loud mouth is someone who talks too much and, you know, very, very deauthorized, I would say. Like I feel all the time. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> what? Uh, how do you call it in, in Brazil? Tiozão? Tiozão do WhatsApp. <laughs> The sound of the WhatsApp. <laughs> I could highly suggest people involved in their local atonements, urban gardens. Yeah, urban gardens are the best. It's one of the few places where you will meet people from all walks of life who have more anarchist socialist outlook. Yeah, urban gardens are, are the best. Even if they don't know... Even if they don't know it, <laughs> there are no real bosses and people help each other all the time. Yeah. If you, if you talk them without throwing the con 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 bread of bread in their face, they just bring up basic stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. 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 Urban gardens are, and they're fantastic and you get to meet a lot of really interesting people. Guillermo, you're Guillermo from the, the Mystificando Izquierda? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Do you, have, do you have experience in urban gardens there? Yeah, I haven't. Are, are there any in your town that you know of? Um, no, I don't know. Oh, I don't maybe, think so. Maybe it's time, it's time to put one together. Urban gardens yeah. are, are fantastic. Urban gardens are great, you know, because, you know, you go there, what are your plants and do the thing. Then you get some freebie, free, free veggies, which is a plus, but it's not about the free veggies. It's about getting together with some other people, you know, making community, hanging out and take, take care of the plants. What, what are you planting? Yeah, that, this one. Oh, that's pretty cool. And then you share, you know, oh, I got, I got a batch of these. You want to trade for this? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty neat. Uh, personal relationship wise, it's really, really cool. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a whole world that I know. It's yeah, it's I have a, a cousin, an older cousin who uh, has a huge garden in his backyard. And and when, when I was younger, it's just like yeah, so whenever you plant things, you grow things, whatever. But then I heard him explain like every single plant in his backyard, and it was like the most complex interesting deep thing and that he had a connection to and it was like oh my god this is a whole world yeah yeah that's cool ah but you're our guillerme okay okay I, I was engaging with the guillerme and uh yeah okay you're guillerme but the yeah from brazil yeah i remember but no, not that not marcos's partner uh they, he was called guillerme as well but you're the, the other guillerme okay oh <laughs> Obrigado. <laughs> so yeah, Dorian Sapiens is saying that in the US the 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 cuñado could be like the racist uncle. <laughs> and thanks. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that type. You know what I mean? And then uh, <laughs> capricious narrative. I'm still looking for stuff where I live. A lot of it is like language barrier stuff. Language barrier. Wow, where do you live that you have to deal with the language barrier? I've dealt with a couple of language barriers in the past. I lived in Poland and I lived in, in Norway. So I I know the drill. I know the drill. It sucks. Oh, you live in Slovakia. Okay, so it's, yeah. Yeah, it's more or less like Polish. It's very difficult to speak Polish, man. Polish is... Uh, I, I got some language uh, nerd friends uh, uh, who are, yeah, but you live in Slovakia, a capricious nerd, but, but you know, uh, at least it's not Czech. Uh, Polish friends say that uh, Czech sounds like a, like a Polish, but, but joking. 
But really, some of my language nerd friends said like the Polish is one of the most difficult languages to learn as a foreign language after Chinese and Arabic. I think it was the mm. toughest ones. And uh, Magyar, Ma Magyar, Magyar is the one from um, uh, I I always forget the name of the place. Um, ah, where's Magyar from? Um, ah, well, this other language which is full of exceptions and. And, you know, you, you miss one letter and it changes the meaning completely. <laughs> it's like a minefield of a language. Mm -hmm. Do you people have any, any questions for, for Damon today? Hungary, yes. Hungary, Magyar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I need, I need to learn Spanish. I know bits. I can understand little bits, but... Yeah, with, the, with your Garcia surname, come on. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's... Uh... It's, uh, yeah, I, I started to, and then I got busy, but I also have a book of uh, Spanish, mis a bunch of writings from Spanish mystics in Spanish as well. And so it's like, that's waiting for me when, when I learn Spanish. Yeah, you're in for a treat. I mean, it, it, it is, a, it takes a little bit of effort to learn a new, a new language, but I would say that Spanish, I would encourage you to learn it because it's very rewarding. You get communicational very fast. So you get to talk, even when you talk like a toddler, you get to communicate things very fast. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, from my experience in le learning foreign languages, it's like you have like a very steep beginning where you're like, oh, I'm learning by studying with books and learning things by memory, which sucks, you know? You're like, ah, what is this? Is this is new? How does it, how is it pronounced? This whole system of pronunciation is different. The alphabet sometimes, most of the times is different. Uh, sometimes radically different if you're talking about, you know, Chinese, Japanese or, or Cyrillic based language, for instances. Uh, so, you know, go like, uh, everything is super steep. And then when you get to a point when you can say, hello, my name is Javi and I, I'm here. I'm very happy to see you. And then, you know, and people talk, you, when you're at the level of, of talking with a cabbie driver and talk about the weather, you're, you're, it's very rewarding. Because you, you can yeah. say, oh, the weather is awful. Yeah, definitely. It's been raining all day <laughs> yesterday. Oh, absolutely. That little bit, it feels like you won language, mm -hmm. <laughs> language world. It, it's fantastic. Yeah. And, and also in the little bit I was learning Spanish, it helps me like get out of this American mindset that this is like the language and the world and the standard. Because I remember like the first thing a lot of people, uh, English speakers encounter with Spanish is like, how come th this is backwards? How come the, the, they say things backwards? It's like, no, actually English is weird like that. That most <laughs> languages um, put the, the adjective and the noun in that order and English is the weird one. I think that was like really fun for me to realize. It's like, no, English is a weird language. And this is like actually the, the other ways of speaking make more sense. Yeah, grammar, grammar in Germanic languages is fun. Uh, con considering like romance languages like uh, yeah. Spanish, Italian, French and whatnot. It's like, uh, it's another game. But once you get to it, it's not that big a deal, to be honest, you know. And most yeah. of it, like a language, like a, the grammar, it's a little bit more flexible in English than in other languages. So you can yeah. you can make like a grammar that is not proper, proper, but still manage to get understood. Mm -hmm. Which is not the case, like, for instance, in, in Polish. <laughs> It's not the case, but for instance, in, in Norwegian, which is another, you know, the Germanic language I, I learned eventually, it's, it's a little bit more flexible too. So mm. it could be, you know, with the Germanic, uh, languages, uh, roots, you know, that uh, you get more flexible grammar. It's, it's fun. Ah, uh, Riendi says that, yeah, Spanish uh, alphabet and pronunciation is similar en enough to English enough defined enough. <laughs> because you got, you got the double R, the rolling R, the R, and you got the <laughs> Ñ and the Elle. Elle is a, like a double L, and it changed to yeah. Elle. But, but it doesn't pronounce the same as the Y, unless you're from Madrid, which, which we're very lazy, and we say <laughs> Yegua and Llover the same, because everything is Y. But no, and the Y can be a vowel or a consonant. Depending yeah. on that. So there's a few death traps there. 
<laughs> but yeah, and the H, the uh, sneaky H, H at the beginning of a of a word is mute. So you don't say hola, yeah. you say hola. Yeah, hola. So there's that. I don't know. There's every every language has its own, but that's part of the fun, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta learn it. Um I so I forgot that I wanted to ask you if you've uh I recently found out about the existence of this of uh the in the nativity scenes mm-hmm. which I think a lot of people are familiar with apparently in certain areas of Spain Portugal and Italy they have a figure called a I think it's pronounced Caganer mm-hmm. El Caganer You know about okay I wanted I never heard of that and then I was wondering if you had seen that being in Spain Yeah it's very it's very I'm... typical from Catalonia yeah, and they make them now with uh, with uh, famous people and stuff. It's just a one t- one guy taking a dump somewhere. It's- yeah, I just posted the Wikipedia article for everybody. I t- think this is really fascinating because yeah, it's the, it means the pooper, um, yeah. and so I t- it's like it's very interesting because I'm also fascinated with like inserting the profane with the sacred in order to reveal a deeper sacred message and realizing that like um, religious art always needs to integrate the profane and the sacred. And when it's just the sacred, I think it denies um, a huge part of the religious experience. And so it kind of doesn't ground it, right? Yeah, exactly. And, And even the incarnation is like God and man coming together. So Christian art should be the profane and sacred always coming together. And so, uh, so there's different, ways of um doing that like like one of my favorite um art pieces is andres serrano this uh catholic artist who did piss christ have you heard of that no where it it was a little white plastic cross uh crucifix um with jesus on it put put into a jar of piss and he took a photo of it and so it's uh it immediately looks and sounds super blasphemous and anti Catholic or or whatever, but in reality he's a Catholic and he was like, I felt like the crucifixion had become too sanitized the way it was talked about in churches, and we needed to re engage with the shock and horror and disruption that the crucifixion should actually stir up within us. Yeah. And so it's um and so, and so, I think that's like it's very a very Christian piece of art that uh, the piss Christ. And so, I think I've just been in general fascinated with the way that like um, dirt boundaries can be broken from a religious perspective. And then I found out about this guy, the pooper, <laughs> in the nativity scene. And it's like I think it's really fascinating. Just the idea of the the nativity scene is supposed to be like dirty and kind of weird like like they couldn't find a hotel or they couldn't find a place <laughs> to stay in, in. and so they had to go into the barn with the animals where it's dirty and stinky and gross and yeah. it's supposed to make you feel like this is a weird place for a god to be born okay it's supposed to disrupt you but it's become sanitized like oh the holy little baby in the holy little barn and it's so uh, nice and clean and everyone's wearing white and everything and so to bring the the Kaganer, the pooper, into this, it's like, ooh, it's reintroducing that that we yeah, need. Yeah, it, ma- it makes uh, – there's a little bit of nuance, though. Like the the, yeah. the Kaganer uh, is, is in the, the, the Spanish nativity scenes. They don't just depict the, the barn. They depict the whole village. So yeah. it's it's like a representation of everybody. We have also another very popular figure is the, the lavanderas. They're just washing clothes in the river. So you 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 gotta you gotta have a river that you sh- usually do with tinfoil or stuff like that, and you put the figure of the of the lavanderas and they're washing their just washing clothes, you know, being like super normal. It's it's so as you say, it's a way of grounding it, but grounding it like to everyday life, not to something dirty because it was supposed to be dirty, but like you know, same old same old. And you have the castle of of Herodes on top of the hill usually. And, uh, and, uh, you know, you have, uh, I don't, I don't know which there, there's a windmill usually involved as well. There are some, some of the traditional figures, 
are trying to depict like a everyday life and then the nativity scene is there and the star you have the star <laughs> which you're yeah. supposed uh, you're supposed to have the star appearing and coming closer with uh, and mm -hmm. w have the three wise men follow so you change every day you change the nativity scene so that the three wise men come closer so mm -hmm. at the day of the three wise men you got you get the three wise men to land at the nativity scene and then you give the gifts and everything else because we do the three wise men in 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 spain instead of uh santa claus yeah so it's yeah, like yeah, they, the, they bring the gift. yeah it's like on the sixth sixth of january or something like that instead of mm -hmm. so it, 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 you start <laughs> You peg the 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 star is like a feels like a comet. It has like a star shape, but also like a little tail. <laughs> and you start moving it. You peg it to a different part of the of the sky. It's it's a very you you need to take some space to make it happen. <laughs> in the I know it sounds like it would require a lot of space. <laughs> it's, uh, in here, it's like you put this little mini nativity scene of just the family of Jesus on the mantle, and it's like. No, I I think that's way more interesting to have the entire village and include all this stuff and like a river and a windmill and uh, people, other people. And it's like, it's, uh, yeah, because to be able to ground it with everyday life instead of uh, depicting the divine as completely separate from everyday life and humans. Hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. Definitely, it's it's there. There's a conceptual thing there going on for real, and it could be you know it could, it's, it's becoming more and more fashionable to have these very almost abstract nativity scenes, you know, because people want to make fashionable and whatnot. But the traditional thing is you get you know half of a room in your house, or if you're poor, you get like on top of a I don't know commoda or something like that, like a little piece of furniture you clear it up from your usual pictures of the family and whatnot <laughs> and then you say you you set up like a chunk of plastic or cloth and you put some uh, sawdust on it as if it were the the ground and then the the aluminum foil as if it were the river and then you get all the figures of the you know that which absolutely they're not up to scale <laughs> but it's fine yeah <laughs> usually very cheap plastic from what i have you know as a kid growing in the 80s And my family used to do it like when when we were kids, we did it every year. And at some point we start we stopped doing it. Even when my parents were like super atheist, but um, like my my mom, she's a, she's an atheist, but she loves Christmas. Mm. So she loves to do the nativity scene. She she loves to do the decoration. She's not so into the tree. The tree is a not very Spanish thing. <laughs> But still, you know, people are adopting it, like people are adopting Halloween and whatnot, you know, they are not definitely. One thing that is curious about the three wise men, we call them Los Reyes Magos, which is the wizard kings. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Melchor Gaspar and Baltasar, <laughs> that's, that's their names in Spanish. And uh, yeah, we, 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 we also have like a little parade of the three wise men. So children go out to the street and, you know, every neighborhood has their own. And then in my city, Madrid, they, they also have like a very big one where all, all the, you know, big department stores try to sponsor and it's organized by the city and it's huge, right? So, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Strotspreti uh, is asking, if, is there such a thing as a Christian atheist? Um, I think there's pl plenty of ways to define Christian atheists, but there are, I have seen some interesting conversations lately about how come Jewish atheists is a lot more normalized, uh, people who say like, yeah, I'm Jewish, my family is Jewish, but I'm an atheist. And how come that's not more normalized in Christian environments of like, yeah, I'm, I'm Christian, my family's Christian, but I'm an atheist. Um, so I think that's interesting and in talking about like, the ways that can evolve and being more like secular Christians and um, like, this is just part of your culture and, um, but you don't necessarily believe in it. And so I think we are seeing some of that definitely. Yeah, that, But then that, that would be every other uh, Spanish or Spaniard atheist, to be honest, we're very <laughs> yeah. into Catholic culture. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, there's that, but then there's also the Christian atheists who are very committed 
to uh, Christianity and atheism. And oh yeah, you just said you looked it up. Yeah, that's what you'll find in the Wikipedia article. Not what I just said, but what I'm leading into that, um, would you, would you say it says that some Christian atheists take a theological position in which the belief of the transcendent or interventionist God is rejected or absent in favor of finding God totally in the world. So yeah, that is more to Thomas Altizer, which was a theologian in the 1960s who pretty much was responsible for death of God theology or sometimes called radical theology, which is pretty much looking at like Nietzsche's declaration of the death of God and also Hegel's death of God and some other philosophies talking about the death of God, taking it absolutely seriously and giving it a theological bend and talking about um, how, and then others within the radical theology tradition, realizing that our world today we see no like transcendent interventionist God and um, that idea of God needs to die in order to be open to um, a God that is more experienced within the world. And, uh, and I'm, I am personally influenced by a lot of that kind of radical theology that I don't talk that much about because partly because it's like, Sometimes you get a bit esoteric and it's like, okay, let's talk about how this actually helps people. And so I find myself talking more about liberation theology than that kind of theology. But um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting and fascinating to be able to uh, talk about God in ways that isn't this powerful uh, being in the sky that intervenes and uh, bends the rules of reality. There are plenty of people who say, no, that God is gone and dead. And so some people would, would come at it from the perspective of that was an old understanding of God. That was our best attempt. And that we now realize that that doesn't work. And we have other understandings of God, more of like a ground of being or something that we live inside of or something like that. But then there are those who are uh, a little bit more literal about it. Like um, Thomas Altizer said that like on the cross, God died and didn't return to heaven, but continued to incarnate further into the world. And so, so there is certain Christian atheists that like, are very serious and theological about it and have a very intentional uh, philosophy of how they're a Christian and an atheist. And then there are those who just like happen to be a Christian atheist because they're just not really all that into it, but they're very, uh, that the Christianity is a part of their culture. Um, and so, so that's why I was originally hesitated. It's like, there's different ways of looking at that word Christian atheist. And, uh, but there, there are people who are asking the, I have friends who who've been like tweeting lately of like, is it necessary to believe in God in order to be a Christian? And, uh, and that's a very, very spicy question. They got a lot of uh, <laughs> backlash for asking that question from fellow Christians, but it's, um, I think it's, of course, the first question that plenty of people have is what do you mean by God? And what do you mean by believe? And what do you mean by in? <laughs> so that's <laughs> like a common question. Epistemology! Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I think there's all kinds of ways of coming at this stuff. But I personally, like, I don't, when it, when I talk about like, what does it mean to be a Christian belief in some otherworldly being is not the first thing that comes to mind. It, that's a, and often I find myself not even getting to that point of um, talking about belief in otherworldly being. It's a lot about like a way of life, a mode of being in the world. And so, uh, yeah, so there are plenty of people who are having those conversations. So, so if anyone wants to look deeper into that, you can look up like, death of God theology and see how they talk about this, but also process theology, which is influenced by process philosophy from Whitehead, which sees everything is in a state of becoming. And then process theology says, including God, God is also in a state of becoming, um, changing along with humanity and the earth and its creatures. And so it's, um, it, it rejects the idea of God as a uh, super being, and realizes that God is like part of the changing universe. And so uh, people can look up process theology too for a different perspective on that as well. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm learning so much. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm, I'm so grateful for this. Oh my God. But, you know, also, you know, on a note of, you know, 
like Nietzsche. <laughs> Don't, don't get me wrong. He had some really good points that if you interpret them charitably, you go like, oh, you know, this is about overcoming your own faults and getting better yeah. yourself without, you know, competing against yourself. Because when, when Nietzsche was dealing with the self, he was really good. But he would, when he was dealing with others, <laughs> the relations towards others, <laughs> he had zero, zero authority there. <laughs> Absolutely. His relationships with others. If you see the life of Nietzsche, it's like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a friend that said, like, we need to realize, like, uh, some of the motivations for certain parts of his philosophy. Like, when we come across his criticism of marriage and claiming that, like, the complete irrationality of marriage, we have to consider that he proposed to a woman by sending a friend with a letter and she rejected it. And then he asked to marry her and she said, yes. And it's like, and then he had to live with them for a while. And it's like, that was like such an awful experience. And of course you would come out the other end being against marriage. <laughs> of course, of course. It's, yeah. just, it's, he was not an example of, of anything like, you know, like most classic writers, to be honest, but you know, In this very case, considering the, the things that he was talking about, most of the time it was out of spite. And, you know, it's fair. We're human, okay? But treat Nietzsche as a human, not as a philosopher yeah. per se. Most of the time. It's like, it's like Nietzsche is a little bit like the last von Trier from literature. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta take him with, with a pinch of salt or maybe with a shovel and a lot of salt. <laughs> yeah. Shovel the salt in there like there is no tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think his stuff on the death of God is interesting, though, because something that was pointed out to me, like, maybe just barely a year ago that I didn't even realize that I think changes how we read that is that a common saying um, in uh, Germany and in that area was uh, God is dying. Like apparently people would say that all the time, like because of what was happening in the world, God is dying. So when he says God is dead, he's saying that in response to people saying God is dying. And so he's saying like, you all are holding on to like this old, um idea of that like that there is some sort of absolute that is determining everything that is happening to us that and but then it, it totally like uh clashes with what we face in reality and you're saying it's it's starting to wither away i'm here to say no it's gone it's done now let's look at human responsibility instead of trying to hold on to that idea that there's going to be some god to come over the hill and save us and so that's interesting when we're able to see it that way and i think part of that is something that christians need to take seriously absolutely and and the idea that um religion requires us to act not to just wait for some god to come down and save us and um and and in, within our actions we in some mysterious way wind up experiencing the divine which is a bit of an, a spiritual clean up your room <laughs> 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 a little bit <laughs> which which was really cool i mean 16 year old me who was reading uh thus spoke zarathustra was super enthusiastic with uh with the with all the good stuff that i was getting you know because from my teenage years that was really good materials you know reading thus spoke zarathustra even when it was grueling considering the that i had to keep two bookmarks one for the book and one for the notes <laughs> mm. <laughs> but if you're if you happen to be german and having read the bible and know a little bit about about the nietzsche's life before reading that book you're gonna have a a, a joy ride a really good time with that one because of the value of the literature because i remember half of the notes were about about uh wordplay that happened mm -hmm. to work very well in german and you know 
you don't enjoy it that much when you <laughs> when you're reading the footnote <laughs> but even like that you got the ah oh, that's so fucking clever so if you get it in german and you know you you speak german and and i have read the bible and really knowledgeable you're gonna get it. first all the all the time that he's trying to dunk on the bible sometimes failing <laughs> sometimes succeeding And uh, you're gonna get also all of the awesome wordplay in German, and you're not gonna have to cope with the two bookmarks, which is a plus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny. Some of the old atheists uh, compared to the new atheists, the new atheist movement. The, some of the old atheists, I find myself like finding very valuable in my spiritual life because a lot of old atheist critique was critiquing the ways that. Um, their societies were using religion to abuse people and how they were really just um, talking about God as a projection of their own biases in order to dominate cultures. And it's like, oh yeah, definitely. Let's get rid of that God. Let's kill that God. Let's critique that God all day. And so, and, and in order, and then for me, as someone who still has a belief in God, it's for me, it's that helps me just take off all the junk that we've piled onto whatever God is. Um, and so I've found a lot of old atheist critiques very helpful for me. Yeah, that's useful critique in general. You know, you deconstruct <laughs> something and, and then, you know, you as you said, get rid of the junk and you come, yeah, out, exactly. you come out stronger at the other end of the critique. You know, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's... But you know, yeah, they they like people like to call critique uh, all kinds of rubbish right now. <laughs> you know, in, yeah, the new new atheist critique is more like straw manning of like yeah, just like all religious people believe this and it's wrong because of that, and it's like and with no. some Nazi stuff sprinkled. Yeah, there. <laughs> <laughs> we're stuck with the Stefan Molly news of the of the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all. <laughs> I don't know. Do, do you know anything about the um, Nietzsche's versus Freud philosophy of ego? I'm not really, I'm not really grounded on that. Yeah, I only know a little bit about Freud, but I don't know about his philosophy of ego. Ah, that sucks. Dorian <laughs> Sapiens is in the chat. Probably knows better, but you know. Yes, Dorian knows. I need, I need to have you on someday. <laughs> yeah, that's great. New atheism sounds depressing and reactionary. Yeah. It often is. It's uh, it's like I don't know what they're thinking. It's a sign of the times. It's a reflection of the times we live in. It, it's yeah, very dreadful. Very dreadful. That's how I we, think there's yeah yeah. I think there's certain atheist critiques too that just need to get over or need to heal from the their religious trauma, and um, it's simply just. A projection of their religious trauma like i i get very uh annoyed and frustrated at certain atheist discourse that is seemingly just taking a projection of a person that hurt you in a church experience when you're younger and just projecting that onto all of religion and it's like it's uh i, I often feel like You need to realize your experience was your experience, and it was just a corner of the entire Christian tradition and the entire religious tradition. Um, you are you were just talking about a very specific event. But what's difficult about that is um, when when we see atheists online saying, "Oh, all religion is bad because of this," and then and and it's because of a traumatic event when they're younger in religious space. We need to take religious trauma very seriously because. Yeah people are like at their most vulnerable and transparent in religious environments. And then someone hurts them. That's like totally uh, life destroying. And so, so, but then they're older and then they're like, well, all religion is this way. All religion is abusive. All religion is brain control or brainwashing and stuff like that. And it's like, and then someone replies by saying, well, actually there's good parts of religion or actually not all religion does that. We have to realize that when that person responds angrily, it's because they feel like they're being gaslit. They yeah. feel like they're being told that thing actually didn't happen to you, that actually all religion is fine. And so those conversations need to be approached very carefully and contemplatively and often just not even talked about. Like I often find myself, when, when if I see like a very angry anti-theist trying to challenge me on this and it's clear that they're speaking from some sort of trauma, I often just 
walk away yeah. and it's like you need to go on your own journey and explore this thing and if you if i make you upset and the things i say trigger you then please leave and like um try to engage in content that is more healthy for you but yeah go on your own journey and if if you would like to hear about this stuff in a deeper way then you could yeah come hang out with us and it's so it's so it's so incredibly good that you can extrapolate that to almost every every other discussion with human beings you know deal with your shit first and then come to me and then we can figure things out you know from a more yeah. peaceful way from more quieter um waters definitely Yeah, it's 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 super interesting how you know you can relate, you can extrapolate all of, all of those all of those happenings, you know, to to the overall human experience. That's one of the things that I I love about our discussions. There, you know, we're taking, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> It is fantastic. That's uh, awesome. A lot of atheists are just the flip side of born again Christians. Okay, the amount of arrogant nonsense I hear from them is embarrassing. <laughs> the anybody who fo uh, the anybody who follows a faith is an idiot stance. Yeah, it's it's very reductive, right? Comes into, yeah, yeah, reductive is a good word. Yeah, it comes into the chorus of "Do not essentialize." Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they feel like they need. Well, here's what I also see is the the atheists who are, and this could. Um, be true for a lot of different perspectives, but the atheists who feel a desperate need to make others atheists or make others not believe, I think what's underneath that is an uncertainty of their own position. Yeah, and they they it's kind of subconsciously feel like if I can make the people around me believe this thing, then that'll help me be able to fully believe this thing without all the uncertainty. And so I, I think. Uh, Uh, people who believe in God do that too, and people who don't believe in God do that, and people with all kinds of positions. And so I think sometimes we need to realize that that the reason they so desperately want everyone around them to believe exactly like they do is because they actually struggle believing it themselves, and they think it'll help them believe more if everyone around them believes it too. Yeah. And and the people who are just strong and solid and it's like, this is my belief, this is my conviction – usually are chill with other people believing different things. It's like, yeah, I believe this, you believe that, no big deal. We can talk about this if you would like. Yeah, I could tell you, but but it's like, yeah, usually if somebody desperately wants someone else to believe it's because they hardly believe it themselves. Yeah, definitely. It sounds a lot like a, a, as a militant radical vegan, you know, it sounds a lot like like uh, liberal vegans, you know, the the ones that just became vegan that week and they want to preach to everyone do not eat meat, meat is murder, motherfucker, and they go let it loose on the family table or whatever, and they go, so it's, it's not the place, it's not the time. Don't go preaching, yeah. you know, let people do their own math, it's fine. You know, talk about abstracts like animal rights, and, you know, let people do the math. It's You don't have to serve everyone, you know, things in a silver platter. And plus, we have bigger fish, <laughs> bigger fish, bigger tofu to fry. Yeah. <laughs> We got bigger chunks of tofu to fry, right? I, yeah. You know, and the, the angry vegan trying to convince everybody probably really wants to eat meat. That's probably a sign that they really want to eat it and they're struggling with it. And they're hoping, well, if I can make sure nobody around me has meat, then that'll make this craving easier <laughs> or or even worse they have like this other this other very lifestyle oriented a very superficial understanding of veganism which is not yeah. at all making you know, it their that, entire security and stability and identity yeah yeah the lifestyleism in general it, it applies to a lot of ideologies in general you mm -hmm. know ideology is something for me you know i don't know if, I mean, from a humble standpoint, I think ideology is something, you know, that it's as reality in a constant flow and you add like little, little, little building blocks and you retire some old building blocks that are a little bit used or tired or don't adjust to the situation. But you got to keep open eyes all the time and say, you know, and uh, take and be humble and say, man, man, I, I, I can't be wrong. <laughs> I'm very often wrong and it's fine, you know, but I'm going to try it anyway, you know. Like, yeah, it's ideology is a little bit, it's very ductile in that way because we deal with such complex, you know, and uh, complex issues you know, that have so many legs. You kind cannot, you cannot of go like, I have the one recipe to end them all. And, you know, 
it kind of got all preachy and shit, you know. It's just be humble, you know. Maybe this is a good idea. I don't know. Let's try it. Worth a shot. That's as mm-hmm. far as it goes. <laughs> the rest of the stuff, you know. And when we need to really be forceful is when, you know, people are hurting and say, stop hurting. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And, you know, again, going back to the vegan case, you know, many people are like, stop having those animals hurting. And it's like, yeah, but don't go, don't go preaching to people. You know, go to an animal farm and do some sabotage there and liberate some animals, you know, as many vegan activists do. The Animal Liberation Front, for me, is a better example than, um, I don't know, PETA, for instance. You know, PETA is liberal and preachy, but the Animal Liberation Front gets shit done, you know, and doesn't yeah. give a fuck, you know. Oh, more or less, you know, if this, this and don't, you know, doesn't go preaching and guilt tripping people about it. So I think there's a little bit of this in these atheist, uh, uh, very performative. Uh, exaggerated atheist types, you know. I don't know. I was just you know. I feel that definitely. I can see that. It's it's important for uh, for all of us to remember that we're winging it. <laughs> yeah, we're all winging it. And uh, shit shit keeps changing too. So <laughs> let's see mm-hmm. what happens next. <laughs> we're not ready, but let's pretend we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's uh there's a lot of i usually say this about the, the big shifts happening within christianity right now but it works in general that a hundred years from now people will be able to, to describe what's going on right now just fine it'll be great but right now we're too like in the midst of it and it's too too difficult we're all just groping in the dark um that we can't really explain what's happening yeah yeah properly. yeah 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 the, uh, the, the, like we mentioned before with the news you know shit is unraveling in front of us and we're like you know yeah we're, we're a rabbit there with the headlights like <laughs> all of this is so overwhelming but you know one one step at a time relying on our comrades our togetherness makes us uh, i guess stronger too you know and reaching out uh, like you know like we're doing right now and just learning together and having a nice conversation like this one, which by the way, we've been going on for about two hours. So I think we're going to wrap it up here for the live session part. And then we're going to hang yeah. out more easy and relaxed in a more private setting. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to the, to the, um, to the chat. Is there anything you want to, you got going on that you want to share with us? Um, what is going on? I feel like I'm I'm kind of kind of like in a transitional space in my life right now with everything happening and so I'm putting out videos and streams whenever I can right now but uh but I'm I'm working on a bunch of stuff. I'm excited to to keep talking and drop the links to my YouTube and my Twitch right on. And, um yeah. I have, a, I have a whole bunch of ideas. I'm just trying to figure out a way to organize them and um, and also deal with like personal life and everything going on. I hear you. But, uh, I hear I, you. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing me on. I uh, love talking to you. Uh, thank you for coming. It's I love talking with you, man. It's it's fantastic experience. Just you know, and I swear, you know, uh, we'll figure out. Do you know anything about this integral abstraction? It's incredibly new to me. Integral I, abstraction. I'm gonna read I know the article. A later. bit, a bit about integral theory. This dude named uh, Ken Wilbur, and I know a bit about spiral dynamics, which is like, uh, pretty, yeah, pretty much. It's just trying to combine different ways of approaching knowledge and stuff, and integrating instead of finding the right one, finding how all these different approaches connect. But I've read a little bit on it. It's it's interesting. It's especially when we when we talk, which we've kind of talked about about this idea of like instead of trying to find the the right perspective, being able to keep growing and developing, and realizing that uh, there's ways that we can integrate different perspectives in a more grown up way. Cool. But yeah. So I'll, 
I'll try I'll try and check it out because I didn't know about it. So <laughs> I'll try and check it out. It sounds sounds really good. Yeah, like the idea ideas in motion and things changing mm -hmm. all the time. There's a Mercedes Sosa song, wonderful Chilean uh, pop star uh, who was singing uh, "Cambia todo cambia," no? Everything's changing all the time. So I don't know. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, we're gonna try and yeah, we're gonna wrap it up. So so thank you all for coming. Have a great one, and uh, we'll have more fun and games. I guess this week I'm gonna do some of the um, uh, Spanish Revolution thing that we've been doing. We have a documentary going on. And I'm trying to translate and comment for the people, you know, translate from Spanish to English and also comment which in the same voice, which doesn't help a lot, but you know, <laughs> we're trying, we do the best we can with the, with what we have. So have a good one. We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna rate someone. We'll see. I'm gonna.